Hey guys, Will here. So today we have a set of SimTag Black Edition Hydraulic Sim Racing pedals here in the studio to check out for you guys. Now I'm really excited about these because these implement a lot of technology taken directly out of real life race cars and that's something that definitely gets me excited. So today we're going to be taking a look at these. They don't come with a cheap price tag though, two and a half thousand euros. So today we're going to be finding out whether they are worth the price tag and what they're like to drive with. So let's get stuck into it. At the heart of this is the Tilton 600 forged aluminium pedal set, which is an off-the-shelf race car pedal set. It's actually, I believe, one of the most widely used pedal sets in the race car industry. So a lot of real-life racing drivers would be familiar with these pedals already. And what SimTag have essentially done is take those pedals and then modify them with a bunch of other components, which we'll look at in this video to create a set of sim racing pedals. So we've got Willwood master and slave cylinders for the hydraulics on the brake. We've got a spring assembly in the back here for the clutch, and then a lever and spring assembly here for the throttle as well. Now we'll just quickly go through all of the bits and pieces that we get in the package and then we'll look at how these pedals actually work in more detail. So in bits and pieces inside the box is a pedal plate assembly, which I actually really like as well. It uses what appears to be a SimLab pedal plate here. It's exactly the same as the one I got with my P1X anyhow. And then a couple of pieces of aluminum profile. Basically what happens is the pedals bolt onto the top of this and then you can bolt this to your pedal plate on whatever rig you have. And I, I really like this implementation because it's nice and easy to bolt to pretty much anything you have. And because it's got the pedal plate implemented inside it as well, you can adjust things around it. It kind of just works together and fits together really nicely. Nice and easy to put together and they include all the bracketry and hardware that you're gonna need to assemble that as well. So really nice design there. Then we've got four mounting holes inside the Tilton assembly itself. And the bolts actually go through that and then if we come over here into our T-nuts inside the aluminium profile. So we're essentially sandwiching it together with the aluminium plate underneath, and that's what houses all of our other various bits and pieces. So we actually have the option of a couple of different colors as well. So we've got black, blue, and red. We'll set those aside for now as well. Those are just anodized aluminium. So if you have a closer look here, you can see how the potentiometers and our slave cylinders are then bolted to the aluminium assembly, which is then sandwiched between when we bolt in from here. So the pedals themselves are actually bolting directly to your rig. And that essentially means as long as there's no flex in the pedal plate on your rig, there's not gonna be any flex through the system. So I really like that design as well. And of course, these are the same fixing points as what they would use to bolt these to a real life race car. So you know it's gonna be nice and solid. Now, other bits and pieces included as well, some grip tape, which you can stick onto the pedal faces if you wish to do so. I don't actually like using that stuff. I find it feels a little bit weird for me, but you've got them there if you want them. Then we have some additional, or different, I should say, rubber springs or elastomer springs that you can insert in the slaves to adjust the pedal feel for the brake. We'll look at that in more detail a little later on as well when I take you through how that works. A couple of different springs included as well. The looks like the stronger spring is installed in the throttle by default. We've got a medium and then a soft as well. I actually like the feeling of the stiffer spring. I think that was quite good. So I didn't actually end up, I did try them out, but um, yeah, I ended up going back to the original one as well. And I feel like what's uh, one of the themes that kind of emerged throughout the process of testing these, and we have had these on the rig for a good 30 hours of testing now over the course of about a month. So yeah, I had a good chance to sort of test all these configurations out. And yeah, I feel like Pretty much the out of the box settings that this came set up with were pretty good. The only thing I actually ended up changing from default was just the spring in the clutch. You can see a green spring there. And uh, by default, this blue spring was installed, which is quite a lot stiffer. And I just found it was giving me leg cramps and it was just unnecessarily stiff. But if you don't skip leg day like I do, then you'll probably wanna leave it with the default setting anyway. I think what they're trying to tell me is that I need to do some working out. Uh, so we'll set that aside as well. And then other than that, it's just down to cabling. So we've got two different options here for connecting these pedals to your sim rig or your system. So we've got a cable here, two and a half meter long, with three automotive grade. And it says in the literature that these are actually Cosworth connections, but these are the exact same connections that you would use to connect to a pressure sensor and uh, a throttle position sensor in your car. And you can see if you get up nice and close on those, they've got metal retaining clips there as well, so they can clip on and not come off again. So really nice there. They're weatherproof as well. Not that that really matters in the context of a sim rig, but quality is quality and that's nice. And then the other side of this two and a half meter cable can connect up to your SimiCube 2 wheelbase to allow these pedals to interface directly through the SimiCube 2 without the need for an additional USB connection. So that works really well. And that also gives us a 16 bit resolution, which is quite nice. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on once we get into the software side of things. 
And then we also have a secondary connection here, which is a shorter three plug connection. Again, we've got one for our Bosch pressure sensor for the brake, and then two for the throttle position sensors that are being used for the clutch and the throttle. And then a serial connection, well, it's not actually serial, it's not actually RS232, but a serial style connection on the other side here, which then connects to a tried and tested Leo Bodner USB adapter, same one that we use for a Logitech set of pedals to convert those to USB to run independently of the wheelbase. So that basically connects directly to our PC. And interestingly, there's no drivers or software actually required for this. There is a piece of software you can use to adjust calibration if you end up adjusting anything on the pedals. But as it comes shipped out of the box, it's all pre-configured and pre-calibrated. So that's a nice little touch as well. There's a little firmware chip inside this that they can write the calibration to. So I think one of the really cool things about these pedals, and one of the things I wasn't expecting, is it was literally just plug it into the PC and it just worked immediately, which was really cool. One little thing I will mention though is you'll notice there's no little screws in the back of the Leo Bodner connection there. And what that means is that when you're plugged into the other side, there's nothing to stop that from coming out. Now, you could easily glue it with some hot glue. You could easily cable tie it if you wanted to, or maybe find some screws that you can put through. But, you know, just little things like that worry me because especially when you've got such high quality connections on this side, to then have a connection that can just fall out so easily on the other side seems a little bit silly to me. So that's one little nitpick before we get too far into this, but yeah, otherwise so far, all the cabling seems to be nice, high quality, and uh, yeah, really no problems at all. So that brings us to the pedals themselves in more detail. So let's have a look at those, and you can see there as I lifted that up, how the actual tilt and assembly, and I've got to be a little bit careful here, is separate and then sandwiched in to the base plate when we bolt it all down to the rig, so that's quite cool. But let's get in now and have a closer look at exactly how all this stuff works. So I think the most logical way to work our way through this is start from the front and kind of work our way through to the back. So we're starting off with mechanical, then we're moving into hydraulic, and then we're moving into electronic, if that makes sense. So as we kind of mentioned before, we've got a throttle that has a spring-loaded uh, mechanism in it. Not much really to talk about there. One thing worth noting here though is that we do have very high quality oil impregnated bushings here on all of the pedal interfaces where they bolt on to the clevises inside the actual housing. And that reduces friction and wear and tear over time as well. So again, race car technology here making its way into the sim world, which is really cool. So spring-loaded mechanism on the throttle. I can't really push that down now because it's not really bolted together. But what basically happens, we'll hold it here. We push that down, it moves a connecting rod connected via two ball joints here, and then moves a little arm which is connected to a throttle position sensor or a potentiometer. And we'll look at that in just a moment too. Exactly the same mechanism if we swing around to the clutch side. So you can see we've got a little connecting rod here connected to an arm which is then manipulating a shaft on our little rotary potentiometer or throttle position sensor. And then we've got a spring-loaded mechanism here which we can adjust from here to adjust the spring tension. Now, one other thing to note here as well, if we look in there, you can see a little thread, push the pedal back, it'll push into that little bump there on the housing, and that is our limit for maximum deflection. Same deal if we have a look at the throttle as well, you can see there's a little thread there that we can adjust up and down, and that adjusts the amount of deflection or movement that we have in our throttle pedal. Now, one thing I will mention is there's no little rubber bumpers or anything like that on here. Again, we are talking about race car parts where noise isn't such an issue. So if that does bother you, just be aware that it is quite noisy when we're driving with the clutch and the throttle. No, no louder than a, you know, a typical magnetic paddle shifter on a steering wheel. But if you are streaming or something like that, you may wanna look at just putting a little piece of rubber or maybe even just a little piece of gaffer tape there just to dull that sound down a little bit. But then let's have a look at how that is then converted into an electrical signal. Then we'll move along to the hydraulics in the brake pedal. So what we have here is a throttle position sensor off a car. Now, essentially what this is, is just a potentiometer or a variable resistor. So as we push the throttle or the clutch forward and back, the little arm moves, that rotates the shaft on the potentiometer. That varies the voltage, which then tells the sim how much throttle or clutch input we're putting in. Now, you might be wondering why such an expensive set of pedals is using a potentiometer, which is something that you would often associate with cheaper entry-level pedals, rather than something like a load cell or a Hall effect sensor and things like that. So, 
essentially this is a automotive grade throttle position sensor. So that is responsible for one of the most critical things on your car, which is interpreting where your throttle pedal is and then relaying that information to the ECU or the engine control unit, which then tells the car how much to open up the butterfly valve on the throttle body and uh, you know inject fuel, all those things that make the car go forward basically. So that is an absolutely critical part of machinery on your car that cannot fail. If it fails, you could end up in a horrible situation where the car starts accelerating. Now there are redundancies built into a car. You usually have a, an, a secondary sensor on the butterfly valve and the throttle body or something like that. So that there's, if there's a discrepancy between the two, it doesn't go crazy, but I digress. What I'm basically trying to say here is that this is a Bosch branded, very high quality automotive grade potentiometer. And there's absolutely no reason to be concerned about the fact that it's a potentiometer. In fact, in many ways, I think it's actually better to use a potentiometer, particularly on a throttle where you're looking at the deflection or the amount that the pedal's been being moved rather than the pressure that's being applied because pressure can be a little bit funny and sensitive what we find and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we uh, talk about the brake as well but as you push down on a pedal you're actually exerting a little bit more force than you use to actually hold that pedal in place and we talked about this in another recent pedal review as well it didn't actually end up being a problem with those pedals but yeah the important point of note here is that just because they are potentiometers and potentiometers are often associated with more entry-level pedals it doesn't mean that they're a bad idea particularly on a throttle pedal so the only thing I would say about this, and you've probably already noticed this, I was a little bit surprised for the price that they're using a 3D printed assembly here. Now I would have expected, you know, at this kind of price point to have billet aluminium or cast iron or, you know, something like that other than 3D printed plastic. Admittedly, there is a metal bearing inside there. So, you know, it's not gonna suffer from wear and tear, I wouldn't imagine. We can see as well that the pedal is hitting the mechanical bump stop here well before it reaches full scale deflection on the potentiometer. So the arm here, the 3D printed arm is never actually under any mechanical load. All it's doing is just inputting a signal via this shaft. So it doesn't need to be any stronger than it is, I don't believe. And again, we have 30 hours on this pedal. We haven't had any mechanical problems at all with these parts. So I don't see it being a problem, but just again, you know, for the money, I would have liked to have seen anodized, you know, billet aluminum parts used there. I just think it would have made it look better and a little bit more professional, but you know, it is what it is. Just wanted to point that out for you guys. And exactly the same deal as well if we spin it around and have a closer look at the sensor that's being used for the clutch. Now I should also mention here before we move on to the hydraulic brake that there is a higher level model available from SimTag as well that gives you a hydraulic clutch pedal as well. Personally, I mean, I haven't tested that particular one, but I have used hydraulic clutches before. I find that when I'm driving and I'm kind of just pressing away at the pedal, changing gears quickly, I don't really notice a difference. And for me, I probably wouldn't be able, without testing it again, of course, probably wouldn't be able to justify the cost of the extra to move up to hydraulic. But just so you guys are aware, there is the option for that should you want to go down that path. So let's have a look now at exactly how this pedal works. Now, one thing you will notice here, there is a little bit of play in the brake pedal. Now, when I did my driving testing, originally that kind of put me off. And then I remembered that when I drive my real life car, I actually have a little bit of play in the shaft as well. And this is a thing that's just inherent to the design of the push rod assemblies in our master cylinders, which we'll look at in just a moment. But there is that little bit of play there. Now I found that when I was driving and kind of resting my foot there, I actually came to quite like that because it was an easy way for me to sort of feel that my foot was located correctly on the brake pedal and not on the clutch by accident or something like that. But just so you're aware, that is that little bit of play there. Now we can calibrate that out. And indeed, when I got these fired up on the rig for the first time, it was already calibrated. So that little bit of slack there wasn't giving me any reading inside the sim. But again, just so that you guys know, there is that little bit of slack there. We saw the same kind of thing with the uh, Racework S1 Pro pedal, a little bit less than this is. But again, just to let you guys know, that is there, should it be something that bothers you. So let's spin this around for you so you can get a better look here at exactly what's going on. So we've got two push rods here, which are connected through the clevis in the middle here via two little ball joints. And those are PTFE or Teflon coated as well, I believe. So there's no friction or wear and tear over time, which again, race car technology. So we've got two push rods, which are essentially running into our master cylinders here. Those are filled with a hydraulic fluid. We've got two reservoirs on top as well, which are also filled with hydraulic fluid so that we don't run dry and end up sucking air through into the system. Then that runs through a couple of brake lines here. Those are braided brake lines, and we'll talk about the importance of that in just a moment as well. That then runs through to our slave cylinders. So as we push the pedal, essentially what's happening is the hydraulic pressure is pushing through and pulling these shafts down. 
And then those are met by the resistance of the springs, which we have inserted in here as well. And that is fully adjustable. We'll talk about that in a moment too. And that is what gives us our hydraulic feeling. So just having a closer look at this again for you, got a push rod here on both sides. Those push rods push into our master cylinders here. And there's a little piston, it almost looks like a valve inside a car that sits there. And as we push down on the pedal, that creates hydraulic pressure, forces the fluid through. The fluid goes through our braided brake lines and into our slave cylinders. So I'm just gonna spin this around again and talk a little bit more about the connections between the master and the slave cylinders, because this is important too. So what we have here is what's known as a banjo bolt. So it's a bolt that goes through, fixes into the master cylinder, and it's actually got a little hole inside it that allows the hydraulic fluid to pass through. And then into this banjo bolt assembly here, which has got another hole in it that allows the fluid to pass through into the braided brake line. So what you can see here, are two little copper crush washers. And again, this is exactly what I would expect to see on a real life car, whether it be a street car or a race car. These are all parts that are taken directly out of the automotive world. So there's no compromise here at all. So those little copper crush washers are a little bit softer than the metal that's used for the banjo bolt, as well as the bolt that's going through the center. So what that does is it creates a nice seal. And again, you can see here, there's absolutely no weeping that's taken place at all around those fittings anywhere. And that's after 30 hours or so of testing that we've done over the course of about a month. So that's all working absolutely perfectly. And then I'll spin it around again to the back here for you. We can see our braided brake lines here. Now, braided brake lines are really, really, really important. We used to see this all the time in the automotive world. Um, people would come into the workshop, they'd wanna upgrade their brake rotors, their brake calipers, and they'd still be using the old rubber brake lines on their um, on their car and wondering why the pedal was still kind of mushy feeling. So when you're under extreme hydraulic pressure, what can actually happen is rubber brake lines can balloon out and actually collapse on themselves as well in the opposite direction. So what that means is as they balloon out, it creates that kind of spongy feeling that you get through the brake pedal. And often what I would recommend to our customers when I was in the workshop was to actually upgrade to braided brake lines on their car before they even looked at upgrading calipers, sometimes even pads as well. Often braided brake lines would actually make the biggest difference to the overall pedal feel in the car. So it's really important that we do use braided lines and not rubber, and I'm really happy to see that being used here. So following the flow path of the hydraulic fluid through into the slave cylinders now we can see nice high quality actually look like there might even be speed flow connectors there i'm not sure either way they're nice high quality and that's running into our slave cylinders now again there's no seepage or weeping going on around those connections at all so that all looks nice and clean after 30 hours of use you will notice a little bit of weeping around the top of the slave zone we'll talk about that in just a moment as well so hydraulic fluid comes through and we already explained exactly how that works. When you push the pedal down, it pulls these in. We then have another hydraulic line coming out to this little kind of dongly bit here. And this is our Bosch pressure sensor. That converts the pressure to a varying voltage, which again, just like with our throttle position sensors or our potentiometers, outputs a voltage, which is then interpreted as brake pressure in the sim. Now again, just to have a little bit of a nitpick here, I don't really understand why this isn't fixed to the plate somehow. It wouldn't be hard, I wouldn't think, to just have some sort of a little bracket there. There must be a reason, and I'm sure that they'll comment down below and let us know. But yeah, it just seems a little bit strange that this is just kind of free floating. I'd imagine if you've got a motion rig in particular, if this is moving around all the time, then over time it is gonna weaken this connection here. So a little bit strange, given you know the presentation of everything else all being affixed to the base plate. A little bit strange that this is free floating, but anyway, it is what it is. You guys can see it for what it is. So. That's what we have to work with. So let's talk a little bit more about how these adjustments here work. So essentially what we've got here is a shaft and we'll actually take this off for you so you can see. So we'll take off the little wing nut, take off the retaining nut as well. And the reason why we have two nuts on there is so that we get some thread binding going on. So as one bolt kind of screws down on top of the second bolt, we bind up the threads together and that stops it from coming loose on us, which is a good thing. So we've got a couple of metal washers here. There's some plastic washers as well. Those are just stacked up. So those don't squish down at all. Those are literally just plastic spaces basically. And then underneath that, we've got what is essentially our spring. I'm not sure if that's elastomer or just rubber. It actually doesn't look like the elastomer that I've seen before, but I'm not 100% certain on that. Shouldn't matter though, but essentially what that is is just a spring. And you'll actually notice here we've got a red and a black spring installed 
and that gives us slight different pressure between the two sides. So it gives us a little bit more adjustability when we vary the spring tension or the spring pressure between the two slave cylinders here. Now, one important thing to note is we do need to make sure that the deflection in the master cylinders is exactly the same between the two sides. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on when we uh, talk about adjustment of the brake pedal. But I'm told that running two different spring pressures across the two different slaves isn't a problem simply because we are running two completely independent hydraulic systems here off two masters and two slaves. If they were linked together, then what would happen is the fluid would naturally flow over to the one which had the softer spring, I think. Yeah, I'm not a fluid dynamics person, but that kind of makes sense to me. Um, but yeah, basically because we have two independent systems here, we can, um, we can run different spring tensions here. And as we mentioned before in our little bag, it actually came with a couple of extras. So we can go two reds, we can go two blacks, which I found to be way too soft. The pedal was almost pushing completely to the ground with that. It felt a lot more like a street car, but for me, having one red and one black was just about right. It was the Goldilocks solution. And that gave me a nice amount of travel in the pedal where I could really sort of feel that pressure point and then modulate around that. But we'll talk about that when we go for a drive in just a moment. Now. I mentioned before, there is a little bit of weeping that's going on through the top of the cylinder here. Now, I spoke to SimTag about this and uh, from what they're saying, and I did send them a video of it as well so they could see exactly what we have here to work with. I'll lift that up as well. I probably should really be wearing gloves for this because this is pretty nasty stuff, but I'm being pretty careful here. You can see there is some weeping going on out of the top of the cylinder there. Again, this is after about 30 hours. And I did a bunch of research online as well, and it seems like this is pretty normal for Willwood slave cylinders. Um, basically what, well, word for word, what SimTag told me is, you know, just give it a wipe clean every 500 kilometers or so, and you're good to go. And the amount of seepage there, look, it's not even enough that it's even running down the sides or anything like that. So I think, you know, basically when it comes to these kinds of things, race car parts, race car problems, you expect to have a little bit of maintenance involved when you're dealing with these kinds of things. But because we're not running through the kind of heat cycles that we do with braking systems on a real life car, we shouldn't have to worry about, you know, things expanding and contracting and introducing air into the system. We shouldn't really need to bleed these any more often than we would need to refill them, which I assume at this rate of seepage after about a month, you know, we'd probably be looking at two or three years before it actually became a problem as long as we were soaking it up and uh, yeah, making sure we cleaned it up. So just so you're aware though, there is a little bit of seepage there and we can see the same thing on the other side. One other thing I will mention is that we did run into this same problem with a little bit of seepage from the slave cylinders on the Racework Pro S1 clutch pedal that I was testing out recently as well. So I think that this is just kind of one of those things that you have to deal with when you're using hydraulic parts. I don't think that it's a problem with this. And as I said, I did send a video to the guys at SimTag and they said that that's within the realms of normal. Obviously we'll monitor it. If it does suddenly get a whole lot worse or start spilling fluid everywhere, we'll let you guys know. But at this point, you know, with my experience from the real life automotive industry, I'd say that that is, you know, within what I would call normal. So let's move on now. We'll get this put back together and talk a little bit more about the adjustments available on these pedal faces. And then we can get into software and driving. So moving back around to the front of the pedals now, let's just talk a little bit more about adjustment here. So we looked at briefly before the two little restrictors that we had on the throttle and the clutch pedal to limit the amount of deflection or movement that we have. So the throttle being here, and this one's gonna to be too hard to press with the spring in there, but the clutch pushes up against this little piece of metal here, or aluminum, I should say, forged aluminum. And that's what limits our movement. Now, the brake pedal is limited in its deflection by the hydraulic pressure, so you're never gonna be able to push it beyond, beyond a certain point. You're just not gonna be strong enough to do it. Um, obviously, the cylinders would max out at some point, but there's no physical bump stop there like we have with the other two pedals. Now we do also have the ability to adjust the pedal angle as well, which is gonna be important, particularly uh, if you're inverting these pedals. So we'll look at that too. So I've got a little threaded bolt here, which is actually kind of like a grub screw. You can see it's got a little hex pattern in it where we can put a hex bolt in or a hex wrench, I should say. We can loosen off the little retaining nut. And if we screw that through the housing here, what it does is it pushes down on the pedal. The more we put it in, the more it pushes the pedal down, the more we take it out, the more the pedal can retract under its spring tension backwards. So again, this is preset and we didn't have any need to adjust this on our particular rig. Uh, we'll move across to the clutch next because that is the most similar. Similar kind of design, but this time we're relying on the spring pressure here. So what we want to do is take off our little wing nut. And then as we tighten the spring assembly here, you can see that clutch pedal moving backwards. And if we go back the other way, we can see it moving forward. So again, you can fine tune that to your heart's content, but 
we found where it was by factory default was absolutely perfect. And even when I went and changed that spring out, which by the way, just involves removing these two bolts, pulling the assembly off and swapping the spring out, very, very simple. We ended up putting it exactly the same place as it was by default anyway. Now the brake pedal is a little bit more complex because it is absolutely critical that you get the measurements exact here. Otherwise you end up with a problem like what we talked about before, where we can run one of our master cylinders or slave cylinders dry. So what happens here is you loosen off the little retaining nuts. And then what we can do is rotate our push rods to screw them into these housings or these threads here or out. And obviously that is going to determine how far in or out the pedal sits. Now, what we need to do is make sure when we lock them down, the measurements on both sides between the front nose or the nose of the master cylinder and the back end of the shaft here is exactly the same on both sides. Uh, so as long as you get that right, you shouldn't have any problems. Normally we do have a balance adjustment here as well with this pedal assembly from Tilton. But what we have, uh, and this is part of the implementation by SimTag, we've got a fixed balance bar that's running through the center of the pedal assembly here so that those are fixed in place and we can't adjust them in and out. So it is just critically important that you make sure that you adjust those to be exactly the same measurement on both sides. As long as you do that, you shouldn't have any problems at all and that gives you adjustability forward and backwards. As we mentioned before, we have the different springs that we can swap in for the clutch as well as the throttle. And then we also have some adjustment on the pedal plates themselves as well. So you can see two sets of holes that are actually offset on the face of the pedal. So that gives us four different spacings or four different adjustments up and down. And that actually adjusts the pedal ratios itself as well. So on the brake pedal, that gives us four ratios. Let me just have a look at my cheat notes here. 5.29 to one, 5.44 to one, 5.61 to one and 5.75 to one. So that's gonna adjust the amount of pressure that's required or the feel of the pedal overall, independent of the adjustments that we make anywhere else. And that also obviously allows you to adjust for the size of your feet as well if you need to move those pedal plates up or down. Now, if we spin that around onto the back as well, we can see three separate holes in each location. So what I've actually done, because these pedals are spaced quite close together and they aren't adjustable on the base itself, they're all linked to the one assembly, I've actually moved my throttle out to the outside, my brake to the inside so it's nice and close to the clutch which I've got in the middle. I've got size 11 UK feet, so slightly bigger feet, slightly wider feet. So that was what I needed to do. That was literally the only adjustment I made to the pedals other than the springs. So I think that covers pretty much everything we need to in terms of the hardware of the pedals. Let us know in the comments if there's anything else you wanna know and we can come back and cover it in a later video. So onto the software and calibration side of things before we go for a drive here. Now there are a couple of different ways you can connect these pedals to your system depending on the hardware that you have. If you have a SimiCube 2, wheelbase like what we have here, you can connect the pedals directly to that and run through the true drive software. And we'll show you that in just a moment. But the majority of people are gonna be connecting via the included USB adapter cable, which is a Leo Bodner cable. It's a universal cable, same one that's used for Logitech G25 pedals. Now, the really cool thing about this is it literally is just plug and play. They come pre-calibrated. If you make any adjustments to the pedals mechanically, you may need to go back in and do some recalibration. But if we go into our game controllers here, once the pedals are plugged in, you can see it shows up as a USB pedal device here. You can click on properties and straight away you can see my clutch is functional, brake is functional, and my throttle is functional. And that's literally all you have to do if you're playing straight out of the box. But then should we need to go in and do a manual calibration, we also have this little calibration tool here, which the download link is included in the instructions that you'll get from SimTag. And as you can see here, this is just a very basic Leo Bodner USB pedal calibration tool or interface calibration as it's called. We do have an auto calibrate button here. They don't recommend that we use that specifically in the instructions. It does say, if you wanna use this, do a manual calibration. And very similar to what we've seen with other pedals in the past. We can adjust our low dead zone and our high dead zone as well as invert. So just to explain that quickly for you, when I rest my foot on the pedal there, you can actually see there's a little bit of data coming in from that slack in the pedal. And we don't wanna have that impacting our braking. So we don't wanna be getting any value inside the sim when we're just resting our foot on the pedal. So we wanna add a little bit more dead zone here. We might try say 150, let me just move this paperwork out of the way. 150, and you can see now I can rest my foot on that brake pedal and it's below the line on the blue bar, which means we're not getting any data coming in. So it's not gonna be applying the brakes in the game when we're just resting our foot there. And then we can adjust our high point exactly the same to the amount of pressure that we wanna push in to get to the maximum. So we just adjust that here. I'm pretty happy with how that's sitting at the moment at 449, but if we were to adjust that to say 490, you can see now I have to push a little bit harder 
to achieve the same amount of braking force. So exactly the same adjustment applies to all three pedals. We just use the high and the low points. And then once we're happy with it, we hit right settings. And that is literally it. So one important thing that I do think is important to mention here is the resolution when using this USB adapter cable because it is a little bit lower than what some people might be expecting. You can see when I push my throttle pedal down to the floor here, we're getting 1023, which means it is a 10-bit uh, encoder that we're using here. So 10-bit resolution or 1024 points of resolution. What that means is that there's 1024 steps as we push down the pedal. Now I did do some back-to-back -back testing connected to the Simicube 2, which does have much higher resolution and the USB adapter. And I personally couldn't tell any difference between the two, but I know that some people will claim that you can tell the difference. So I did just want to point that out to you guys uh, just for the sake of completeness, but we'll get these connected up via the uh, Simicube 2 now, show you how that works and then go for a drive. So up and running through the Simicube wheelbase now, and you can see when we push the pedals, we have our analog values coming through. So that's all working nicely. There is a little bit of configuration that you will need to do here. So we click down on our hardware settings. We click on configure analog inputs and very similar to what we had before in the Leo Bodner adapter calibration tool. So the Simicube 2 has provision for a range of analog inputs, uh, three of them being brake, throttle and clutch, of course. So we've connected and uh, configured here. So DB15 brake pin is brake. DB15 gas pin is throttle, obviously, and then clutch is clutch and then we've adjusted our high and low thresholds exactly the same way as we did before so that they correspond and we have a little bit of dead zone there so we can rest our foot on the pedal without getting any reading you can see there if i put my foot on the brake we're not getting anything until we actually you know intentionally push on the pedal and same deal with the clutch as well now as we push the throttle down to 100 percent here you can see unlike the 1024 or 10-bit resolution that we had previously we now have 16-bit resolution or 65,536 points of resolution, obviously the first number being zero, so zero to 65,535. So much higher resolution, just to note for you guys as well. So once you're happy with that, one thing that I do like about what they have here is we do have an export and import option here. So we can set up separate profiles for different cars if we wish to do so and export them, import them. And then once we're happy, we click OK and we go back to here. And as you can see, we're good to go. So that is it in terms of calibration and software. Time to go for a drive. So we're all set up here and ready to go in a Porsche 911 Cup car at Imola. This is my favorite car for testing brakes simply because the difference between driving quickly and consistently and locking up the brakes and sliding off into the kid litter is very, very small. So it really does reward those who are good under brakes. It's also a car and track combination that I am well familiar with. I did a race here for the Porsche Esports Super Cup All-Stars a couple of weeks ago using these exact pedals. So I am familiar with the, uh, with the arrangement. But there's a couple of little bits and pieces that I wanted to point out to you before we head on the track here. One thing in particular that I think is gonna be relevant in the, uh, in the context of sim racing. Now, we talked before in the uh, Closer Look segment about the 3D printed parts. Now, I mentioned there that I didn't think that they were gonna have any impact at all on the performance. There's not gonna be any flex because we are hitting the mechanical bump stops on the uh, tilt and plate before we get anywhere near the maximum deflection on those potentiometers. And you can see when I'm pushing on the pedals there, we are hitting those bump stops and there's no flex there whatsoever. So that's definitely not a problem at all. There's not gonna be any risk of breaking anything in that regard. Now, one thing that you might've noticed there when I was pushing on the pedals is that the throttle and the clutch are quite noisy when they hit those mechanical bump stops. That's simply down to the uh, stopper screw or the uh, restrictor hitting the, uh, hitting the metal plate underneath. Because it's metal to metal contact, it does make that noise. Now you could put a little rubber stopper under there or something like that. That is something that I probably would like to see them add just for the context of sim racing. I know it is a race car part and race cars are noisy, but a lot of people are playing in their living rooms, you know, right next to a bedroom. They don't want to be waking the baby or the missus. And it is also, of course, something that you want to be mindful of if you're streaming or doing content creation too. If you've got noisy pedals going on in the background, it can be distracting for some viewers. I haven't found it to be a problem. I haven't found it to be too loud over the sound of my headphones with everything else that's going on in the context of this rig. Obviously having motion platforms and everything running as well does add a lot of extra noise. But if you've got an otherwise quiet rig, you're gonna be hearing the pedals clicking away as well as just shifters. So I just wanted to point that out to you guys. But otherwise, I think the only other thing that may bother some people just as an initial impression sitting in the car is just that little bit of slack or dead zone in the brake pedal. Now, 
I actually found, you know, it, it did bother me when I was first driving with these pedals, but once I'd been driving for a little while, I actually found I quite liked it because it let me know that my foot was engaged and it was, it was, it was kind of like a point of reference. I knew that my foot was on the brake, but because we've set that little bit of dead zone there, it's not actually making any input in the game. So it's not doing anything. And, you know, for those who are familiar with driving race cars or even real life, you know, street cars, there is always that little bit, well, usually that little bit of play in the brake pedal. So it is kind of normal and it is kind of genuine. But again, just something that I think is important to point out because it is a characteristic of these pedals. There isn't that dead zone in the uh, throttle or the clutch though. Those retract all the way completely back and uh, are nice and springy right from the onset. So anyway, I think that covers everything we need to while we're sitting stationary in the pits. So let's head out quickly now. I'll get my motion platform running and seatbelt on and everything, headphones on, and let's go for a drive. All right, let's head out here. Now, I have been driving the Cayman a lot more than the 911 the last week or so, just because that's what we've been racing in the All-Stars series. So my muscle memory is gonna be a little bit sketchy compared to what it was when I was at the height of my training with this car and track combo. But what I wanted to do here is talk a little bit about the initial impressions of the pedals when I got them first set up, as well as just, you know, I guess, the, the impressions as I've gotten to know them over the last three and a half weeks. And about 20 hours, I'd say, I've put into these of intensive testing and really sort of trying to dial in my consistency for those All-Stars races. So when I was doing this track combination and track and car combination at the height of my practice right before the race, I did a session where I was able to achieve a best lap time of 147.9. And this is with, um, this is with baseline setup and 100 litres of fuel as well. So the car is obviously a lot more difficult to drive in that configuration. But more importantly, I was able to achieve a consistent lap time within 0.5 of a second for 30 laps, you know, consistently. I just was doing lap after lap after lap. And yeah, didn't go outside of that sort of 0.5 of a second range the entire time with no mistakes no spearing off the track, no major lockups or anything like that. So I think that's really just down to the consistency that the brake pedal feel being hydraulic gives you. And it was the same kind of impression we had with the, um, with the race work pedals that we reviewed a couple of months ago now. I just really found that they gave me an advantage in terms of my consistency under braking over the HE Ultimates that I've been using previously. Now, there is a lot of adjustment scope there as well and you can dial them into be however you want and um you know i have spent quite a bit of time adjusting the he ultimates too and you can get them quite close but i just find compared to hydraulic pedals you're just never quite able to get that same you can break to the you can break to an accurate threshold but modulating around that threshold is where i find the hydraulics really come into their own so we'll try and practice it into the first turn here for you so I'll intentionally brake a little bit too hard, lock up a touch, and you can see I'm modulating around that, and even though I made a little bit of an intentional mistake there, I was still able to hit that apex without any problems. So I was able to modulate my brake pressure, and you'll see on the telemetry overlay where I was doing that, but I was able to do it very accurately and not miss the apex and not lock up. So that's really where I feel the brake pedal in particular comes into its own. Now, there is a model of these pedals above the ones that we have here, which also includes a hydraulic clutch. We'll talk about the clutch a little bit later on. We'll go for a drive in something where we can do some heel and toe. But for me, at least, I don't really feel like it's worth the extra money for the hydraulic clutch as well. I don't really feel like it adds anything of value to the experience. Because generally when you're using a clutch, you're just kind of stabbing at it anyway like that. You know, you're just kind of going bam and you don't really feel the difference. The spring tension on this one is quite nice anyway, but again, we'll talk about that later on. But really, I think where hydraulic pedals come into their own is just in that brake pedal feel. That's really where the value for money lies and where the justification is for spending so much on a set of pedals. Now, just in terms of initial impressions as well, one thing I did notice straight away was these pedals are quite close together. Now, the Tilton pedals, as you know, are taken directly out of a race car. So they're, they're exactly the same as what's used. And I think, I think they're actually the most commonly used pedal set in, in race cars in general in the world. So obviously they know what they're doing when it comes to the spacing. But I did find I had to move the brake pedal pad over as far as I could to the left and the throttle as far as I could to the right to make it comfortable for me. I'm size 11 UK feet, so not the biggest feet in the world, but not the smallest. But yeah, the way I've got it set up now, very, very comfortable, no problems at all with sort of, you know, bashing my feet into each other. And I did find as well, 
having them a little bit close together like that does aid with heel and toe driving. So I think the spacing's good. I don't really feel like it's a disadvantage not being able to move the pedals from side to side on the base plate itself. So that's not really a problem. I know that might be something that's a little bit of concern to some people just looking at the pedals. But yeah, look, overall, I've just found them to be, the more I've gotten to know them, the more I've begun to appreciate them and really sort of just enjoy the experience of driving with them. I haven't had any problems with, uh, with maintenance or any sort of reliability issues at all with these either, which has been good. And uh, yeah, just really happy with them overall. Now we should talk about the throttle as well a little bit. Obviously that doesn't have any hydraulic dampening as we saw earlier. Some people like to have a little bit of hydraulic feeling to the throttle pedal. I've kind of been hit and miss with that on a few of the different pedal sets that I've tried. Uh, talking about the Fnatic V3s in particular, I didn't like having the damper on the throttle on those because I felt like it gave me a little bit of hysteresis or lag lifting off the pedal. I found like it kind of didn't come back with my foot super accurately, whereas these, have got a really nice amount of spring tension. They feel exactly like they do in a real car. Obviously, you know, being a pedal set out of a real life race car, you'd expect that, but the spring tension is absolutely spot on for me. Really, really love it. And yeah, I mean, really just everywhere I look, the more I get to know these, there's nothing about them that I'm finding that I don't like at all. The, the driving experience is really solid. Consistency is great. No problems with maintenance and just overall a really, really great driving experience. So let's just try and put in a quick hot lap now for you guys. Let's see if I can get close to that 147.9, having not really done any practice in this car for a couple of weeks now. So we'll break early. Trail break in, a little bit of a slide there, but we still hit the apex, get on the throttle as soon as we can. Back out a little bit there. Braking at about the 75 mark. Downshift, little bit of throttle, braking some more, get it turned in. Back on the throttle as soon as we can. Braking at the 50, turn her in nice and late. Late apex here, get on the gas early. Run it out nice and wide. Now these next few corners are tricky because you're kind of braking as you're turning a little bit. Brake at the 50. Back on the gas as early as we can, run it out nice and wide. Braking downhill. So, braking at the 50, getting it turned in. Little bit of throttle again, just to balance the rear. Bring it round. Hit the apex on the gas as early as we can. And this is the tricky one. So, braking at about the 80 meter mark. Bouncing her over the curbs. Get it turned in. Not running too wide, we don't want to get a slow down. And then again, breaking downhill into this last section. So we're gonna break pretty much at the peak of the apex. Tail wants to break away from us a little bit, turn her in. And try and get nice and early on the gas, run out nice and wide. Felt like a pretty clean lap. Let's see what kind of time we got. One forty-seven four. there we go. So again, there's that consistency. We are running a little less fuel in the car at the moment. So that definitely helps as well. But um, yeah, that's ideal track conditions as well. So I'm not surprised it was faster than the fastest lap we did in that practice session before when we did have variable weather conditions. But there, there you go, that's, you know, jumping straight back in, sort of resetting my muscle memory and able to pull a nice clean lap there for you guys. So. Let's uh, jump into something where we can do a little bit of heel and toe for you guys, talk about that, and uh, then we can pull it all together with our conclusions. All right, so Ferrari F40 in the rain here at Nordschleife. Let's uh, get this underway. Now, I need to admit that I'm not the world's expert when it comes to heel and toe driving, so I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments that might own these pedals as well, what, what your impressions are. But let's talk about the clutch first. I did end up going with the weaker spring that they include for the clutch. So I did swap that out and uh, I did find that that made it a little bit more natural feeling to me. The stiff spring was quite stiff and I did find I got a bit of a sore leg driving with that one. But yeah, once I put the softer spring in, absolutely no problem whatsoever. So it feels very nice and I don't feel like it needs a hydraulic dampener. So yeah, it just it feels very natural. And I mean, most clutches are kind of just a straight push anyway, especially when you're doing this kind of driving 
you don't notice that second stage rollover that you get with a lot of these um, high-end pedals. So looking at the Fnatic V3s, for example, and the, um, and the Houston Felt Ultimates, they have that second stage where when you push down the clutch pedal, it kind of rolls over and it gives you that kind of friction point. I just don't really find a huge difference with those. When you, when you sit there and you pay attention to it, yeah, sure, you can feel it. But when you're actually driving and you're kind of just clutch kicking away and you know doing what you need to do, I just don't notice it. So I'm perfectly happy. I find that this clutch to be perfectly adequate. I don't really f see the need to spend the extra money for the hydraulic clutch. Some people might disagree with me, but that is, um, that's my opinion on it anyway. But look, in terms of spacing and everything, very easy to roll between the brake and the clutch, or the brake and the, the, brake and the throttle, I should say. Um, I did, as I said before, move my brake pedal across, or the pad of the pedal across to the left as far as it would go, and the throttle across to the right as far as it would go just to accommodate for my slightly larger than average feet. But you can see there, able to roll across very easily. The bevel or the curve of the pedal face as well makes it very easy to roll across. And yeah, it just, it feels very, very natural. It feels exactly the same as doing the same thing in a race car to me in the few race cars that I have driven. And yeah, absolutely nothing to complain about there whatsoever. It feels very natural, easy to adapt to. And uh, having that slight offset that you can see between the face of the brake as well means that when you are pushing down on the brake, you can roll across like that and it works very, very well. It's not like, I mean, you know, most pedals you can adjust the forward to back movement anyway, so it's not really a problem, but I can roll across, no problem at all there. And it feels extremely natural. So I think that's pretty much all we need to cover there. I mean, again, those of you who are experts on heel and toe driving, feel free to chime in, but I think that's probably all the value that I can add with my level of experience. So let's move on into our conclusions. So overall impressions of the SimTag Black Edition hydraulic pedal set. Now, as a person who has lived and breathed race cars pretty much my entire life, I think it's super cool to have a set of genuine race car pedals that have genuine race car parts on the sim rig. I think that it adds to that immersion level. Every time you get in the rig, you kind of look at it and you go, yeah, this is cool. So I love, I love that factor. Some people might prefer a more kind of refined and beautiful design, something that's designed more for the simulator environment. But you know, that's that's a subjective thing. But I personally think that these look really cool and I, you know, it's something that I appreciate every time I get into the sim rig. Now, in terms of the driving experience, I feel like these really nail everything that is important to sim racing. Uh, the brake pedal feel in particular is fantastic. We've got all the feeling we need there to modulate our braking and be consistent. And as we could see from my lap times through my testing and my experience with the 30 or so hours that I've put into these, no problems at all. And I did genuinely find that it made me a more consistent driver over other pedals that I've used in the past. Pretty similar to other hydraulic pedals that we've used in the past, but we were kind of expecting that. I think you know, once you get your adjustments dialed in, they are kind of same, same, at least the ones that we've tested to this point anyway. So it really comes down to the adjustability that's available between particular different sets of pedals and, you know, just overall build quality. Now, in terms of adjustment, we did have all the adjustment that we needed. We were able to dial in a good spring pressure here using the red and black springs in the end. And we did have included in the kit a few other springs and bits and pieces that we could use to adjust things. We ended up adjusting the clutch to the weaker spring as well. That felt really nice to me. And just overall, I felt like the feeling once we got everything dialed in was really really great and we didn't really have to do a whole lot of adjustment other than just the brake springs here we didn't have to adjust the pedal angles the calibration or anything else like that it all just kind of worked out of the box which i think when you consider the complexity of the setup was quite impressive they've obviously taken the time to do their r d they know what people are going to want as an experience straight out of the box and they've been able to really nail that so thumbs up there there was that little bit of play in the brake pedal there which some people might be bothered by I was a little bit bothered by it when I first started driving, but once I kind of got used to it, I actually found that I quite enjoyed it. It's very authentic in that it feels very similar to the play that you would have in a real car pedal. I think for most people, if you've ever sat in a race car, everything isn't completely tight. There is little characteristics like that, little nuances. So it does feel quite authentic and genuine. And I actually did find it helped me to locate my foot on the brake pedal and kind of know where I was in space at times as well. So that was quite good. I didn't really see that as a problem, but it is something that I do need to point out to you guys that may be bothered by that. I was very happy with the spring pressure on the throttle, didn't have any issues there. The only thing I would say with regards to the throttle and the clutch is just that uh, metal to metal contact sound you can hear there. 
and that's just down to the little restrictor screw making metal to metal contact. So I would like to see a little rubber pad or something put underneath there just to reduce that level of noise. Again, it does kind of add to that authentic race car feel. Those are the kinds of things that you do experience in a real life race car. But when you're in a living room and you're wanting to sort of keep noise levels down, maybe if you're streaming and things like that, it may be a bit of an issue for you, but easily rectified if it is a problem. Something I just thought I would point out for you as well. So that was on the throttle and the clutch. No such issue with the brake pedal whatsoever. After the 30 or so hours of testing that we've put into these, we did notice a little bit of weeping of fluid from both of the slave cylinders. Now I got in touch with the guys at SimTag and they told me that that is pretty normal. You just wipe it off and you're good to go for another 500 kilometers is what he told me. I did a bunch of research independently online as well into these particular slave cylinders and it does seem like that is a pretty common thing in uh, real life car implementation of these slaves as well. So I wouldn't say that it's something to be put off by, but you know, it is something to be aware of. I wouldn't imagine that it would impact on maintenance for quite a long period of time. It doesn't appear to be drawing air back through the seals and creating air bubbles or anything like that. We did open these up and check that there weren't any air bubbles internally and that wasn't a problem. Uh, we never felt any sort of graininess or any sort of feeling that would indicate that there was air being induced into the lines at all. So that's all absolutely fine. I'd imagine that maybe after a year or maybe two years of operation, you might need to do a little bit of maintenance, but we didn't come across anything, at least in our testing, that would be concerning us in that regard. Now, other than that, really, it's just little tiny nitpicks uh, and, and really those are only just when you consider the price of this pedal set. It is a very expensive pedal set. I was a little bit surprised to see the use of 3D printed plastic arms to connect to the genuine Bosch automotive grade throttle position sensors that they're using for potentiometers on the clutch and the throttle. I would have expected to see billet aluminium on a product that costs this much money and of this caliber. Now it is important to note that these aren't taking any sort of mechanical load whatsoever. That is all being handled by the pedals and the restrictors that we see on those. So I don't see wear and tear being a problem on those. It just comes down to the overall fit and finish of the product. I personally would have expected to see billet aluminium on something of this caliber. So that was one little nitpick. Another one is just the pressure sensor here. Again, it is a genuine Bosch pressure sensor, but I was a little bit surprised to see this kind of just free floating. I would have expected to see it mounted in some fashion on the pedal plate. You know, again, with this moving around, if you have a motion rig or something like that, you would definitely want to secure this so you don't end up popping the uh, brake line out of the back of the fitting over time. So other than that, it really is just small nitpicky stuff, but I do think it's still important to mention these things. So the Leo Bodner USB adapter, that is only a 10 bit resolution. So only just over a thousand points of of resolution throughout the pedal stroke. That may put some people off. Admittedly, I can't tell the difference in pedal feel uh, and how it translates in the sim between this and the 16-bit resolution we have when we connect through the uh, SimiCube interface, but that may put some people off. One thing that I wasn't super happy about here was the fact that there aren't any screws in the back of this USB adapter. So when you plug it in to the other side of the cable, there's nothing there to stop that from coming loose. Now, of course, there's no reason why you couldn't glue this or you know, cable tie it or something like that. But again, for a product that costs this much money, I would have liked to have seen a slightly more uh, high grade solution that would avoid even the possibility of something coming loose and becoming disconnected while you're driving. Last thing you want is to have a motion platform running and your pedals come unplugged while you're driving in a championship race. That would be really, really upsetting. But look, that is just a small nitpick. So those small little things aside, I don't think any of those really take away from the fact that these provide a very genuine and authentic race car like feel for your simulator and I really have no reason not to recommend them I think they do a fantastic job and I think that you'll be very very happy with them should you choose to buy them so we put some links down in the description below to where you can pick these up if you do want to pick up a set for yourself but yeah guys let us know in the comments if there's anything else you'd like to know if you have a set of these yourself let us know how you feel about them in the comments as well but above all thank you very much for watching guys leave a thumbs up if you've enjoyed the video consider subscribing as well if you haven't already we do have a bunch of other pedals that we're going to be reviewing in the coming months as well to compare against these and other pedals that we reviewed so stay tuned for that but thank you very much guys we'll see you again soon bye